yeah, we don't think of ourselves as close to Texas, but that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> Closer exactly. than you usually are. So it's good to have you in America. Yeah, appreciate that very much. I'm, I'm enjoying it here. But thanks to uh, Marcus for bringing us all together to talk about one of the greatest yeah. running events in the world. Which I, no idea, which I have no idea about, but luckily Bronk is here. I, know, I was, I was going to say, Matt, wait, uh, what's your experience? Zero. I mean, I've coached quite a lot of people to run at Boston, but I've never yeah. been to, I've never actually, well, I have been to Boston, but not for the marathon. So that's um, crazy. To, that's crazy to me. I mean, I knew you hadn't run it, but I'm like, I was thinking about, it, I'm like, wait a second. You've gone to like yeah. everything I've wanted to go to. And I'm like, you haven't been to Boston. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's one of the, it's one of the, I think it's really the only major that I haven't, haven't been to because the other ones I've been to it, it or run or watched. So yeah, yeah I've, like, I've just missed out for all these years and, I'm looking forward to going to going this year and uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. What's, what's the goal for you though for Boston? Um, so, so the only reason why I've got an entry is because Reem, you know, Reem's American, so Boston's like the grand final <laughs> to, to qualify for. And um, she entered last year, and I entered assuming she was going to get in right because she had the qualifier, but then she didn't get the five minute window, and then I was left with the entry. And for a while, I was like, okay, I'll probably just cancel the entry, and then. You know, you signed up. A whole lot of people I coach signed up. A whole bunch of friends are going. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go. I'm, I'm living nearby, like for an yeah. Australian nearby. Um, and so I'll just go go, go there for the race and run it. I'll probably just run at about six-minute miles or around there, like a steady, solid long run. Probably be pretty hard still, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I saw that you're, well, we can talk about that. I don't know how, much, how focused or wide-ranging. I saw um you want, uh, sorry, I, I'll finish the thought. I'm not sure how focused or wide ranging you want to be on this podcast. I saw you yeah. obviously on Eric, uh, his video for like his, um, his preparations for Boston, which I have to say, I was thinking about it and I'm like, I know that we have to put goals out there to, for like storylines, but like sub 235 is just like, it's it strikes silly. like no excitement. And I'm like, okay, dude, like, <laughs> I just, yeah. I, it, but I've it's sad because like two thirty is like yeah. I just switched microphones. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, um, it's just, I basically had this discussion with him. I was like, but he knows, like he kind of yeah, knows. He knows. He obviously. He I mean, he's a he's a filmmaker. Time. Like, <laughs> I like no like pursuit of this really random number. That's like, I don't know. It's for someone funny. that's so that's I feel like for someone that's so. Um, I'm lacking the right word, like interested in Boston and, and loves Boston. I feel like that's almost a, 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 almost an offensive thing to do to come up with a time because <laughs> I know I've never been there, but yeah. I know that having a time goal in Boston is like not that doesn't really it's make like, a lot of sense. Yeah. It's like, I mean, I've definitely had it, but in hindsight, we can talk about it. We can talk about the pod, like um, time goals. And I'm doing this whole workshop. I'll talk about like, and everyone just wants to know. They're just like, cut the shit, Bromka. Like, give me the splits I need to run to hit my, <laughs> you know. Then I'm like, well. You're like, six minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> by the way, we were recording, by the way. So I'm going to include some of this stuff in the, the pre-chat <laughs> as well. Mark, stuff normally Marcus, makes sense, actually. Yeah, exactly. All the chopped up. So. Um, and I want to, I, Marcus, I want to, um, get up to speed on how you're feeling on things as well. So you'll have to do it, give us that rundown for those of us who, you know, follow your training. Yeah. yeah don't yeah. let us hijack your, your series here. This is about you, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, it's, it's good to learn from everyone else. So, but Peter, first of all, can I just talk about that sweatshirt though? Obviously the people oh, that yeah. can't hear the podcast, it says runners don't cry. Can you runners talk about don't that? Cry. This was wonderful. Um, a woman I know, Margot uh, Fleming, who actually, um, her father, Wait, why is that? Why am I blanking on her father's name? Um, he won the New York City Marathon 50 years ago. Um, and he, she, this is a tongue-in-cheek shirt, um, and it was a fundraiser for mental uh, mental health nonprofit. Um, so um, the Jed Foundation, I think, I believe, um, which is just you know supporting people in reaching out um, in times of need. Um, and so it's like a takeoff on Boys Don't Cry, the movie. Um, from a while back now um i think it's like the same typeface and so then it was like a tongue-in-cheek like um you know no actually people do go through a lot and it's okay to ask for help it's okay to um and so she showed these when she was running the speed project solo um when she was going from los angeles to las vegas over like five days um 
totally ridiculous. And yeah, it was cool. Um, and I was like, well, that's that's a fun shirt. I'm I'm getting more and more into uh, the like ridiculous. I'd say like paraphernalia, you know, like the official shirt from a, from a, like, oh, that's a cool design. And then the like totally one off, like not going to see that shirt again. Probably a bad idea. <laughs> you know, like like the clashing colors. I'm like, OK, yeah, that's for me. Um, yeah. So okay. no, I like I like it to be honest, but I, I've got to admit that I've cried, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. I think that's I think that's the tongue in cheek part. Everyone's like, wait a second. And you're like, yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And I mean, we can talk about Boston, like the, I am always, yeah, my eyes are always open for like, who's going to do the pop up, you know, run of just like a small run of whatever, uh, from some, uh, some obscure brand that we'll see, you know, that'll be out there. Uh, cause I don't know, God forbid, I don't need another t-shirt, but I like, <laughs> I'm like, Ooh, that's kind of cool. And I'll end up buying it. I get home and I'm like, why did I buy more t-shirts? <laughs> So we could go down the Boston jacket route, but we're not going to go down that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. All right. So for the listeners, just to give a bit of context. So myself, um, this is obviously the podcast, a runner's life, but this series is untitled and I thought it'd be quite a fun idea to get my coach, Matt and Peter, who I've become friends with on Relay, a really experienced runner uh, and got so much knowledge about Boston on one sort of series to talk about my prep and to try to, get as much information so rather than doing the really boring kind of like let's cue some music and i'll do an intro for both of you <laughs> can you both <laughs> give an intro for who you are so you're the the only boring markets is that what you're saying <laughs> yeah, let me cue the music <laughs> dun, dun, dun. um matt, right. please introduce yourself okay i'll go first uh i'm matt fox i've been running uh for a long time 16 years uh probably marathon for about six years now and I've been working with Marcus for, for about nine months uh, on improving his all distances, really, from 5K through to the marathon. Uh, I'm a 220 marathoner myself um, and have learned a lot of lessons along the way, progressing from 259 down to 220 in however long it is, five years. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here and talk about Marcus's build up to Boston. We've got seven and a half weeks now, so it's pretty meaty training going on at this point because... Yeah, I say it all the time, that sort of three-week out to 10-week out block is really the specific phase, so to speak, although, you know, it goes all the way through until race day. But Marcus is in the middle of the really high volume now. So, yeah, excited to be here. And thanks to Peter Bromka for joining us because I actually haven't run Boston and I've done, um, you know, I've, I've, I've actually only been there for two days on a holiday maybe five, six years ago. But Bromka is the, is the Boston Marathon master and expert, knows everything about the course. There's every meter, every mile. So a great combination of people here to discuss Boston Marathon and Marcus's build up. Awesome. Peter, really quickly, actually, I want to ask this. Do you prefer being called Peter or Bromka? And it doesn't matter like who asks you that <laughs> refers you to in that way. Oh, I that's funny you ask. I actually I enjoy both. Um the only what's funny is no one calls me Pete, um, except for in certain athletic contexts, um, certain like coaches or coach types of my life. will say like, we'll just automatically adopt like Pete over here. Um, so you, neither of you were calling me Pete, but that's just a certain, I listen for it in certain contexts, but Peter or Bromka. Um, yeah. I mean, my last name is Polish, uh, derivation from likely shortened when, you know, the, when my great great grandparents came over to America. So there aren't a lot of Bromkas in the world. And actually, when, growing up, I think we thought we were the only. And then as the internet expanded, we were like, there's more Bromkas out there, but we're, it's very unclear. Um, so it's pretty rare. So it allows for like some, you know, clarity. Um, yeah, I'm Peter Bromka. I am happy to be here with you two. Um, Marcus, selfishly, when you told me that Matt was your coach, I was psyched because I was like, oh, like I, Matt and I have been trying to connect more. Um, we got connected years ago and I was like, um, you know, just looking to chop up ideas more with Matt. And, um, I will say as an intro, um, I have run the marathon, Boston marathon eight times. I've run a bunch of marathons, been running for years. I ran it back as a charity runner in 2005. Um, I was thinking about this, not to like to my own horn. <laughs> But I was like, I, do, I think there's probably not a ton of people who run as a charity runner and open runner and part of the pro start. And I was like, wow, that is kind of fun. Um, but Matt, <laughs> part of what I appreciate about your content is you have like thrown yourself into it enough 
that you've been fully like immersed in all the details and also humbled by all of the different facets of the sport, I would say, <laughs> for those of oh, us yeah. who follow who follow closely. And I realized like I have this really black and white hot button um, judgment. I gauge people who post online and it's whether they come at it from like, I'm the expert, I figured it out and here you go to like, okay, the, so this thing is really complex and it's like simple, but it's tricky. And here's some things you might run into and here's some things to watch out for. And I'm certainly in the latter. And I consider a lot of your content to be in the latter. It's like, okay, so here's the simple principles, but actually in reality, it gets tricky because of these things. Um, and that's what I've appreciated about Sweat Elite um, is like, you guys aren't saying like, here's the new method of training and you're an idiot if you don't adopt it you're like this is pretty enticing probably could break most people <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> and so that's what i've uh certainly i think when we first got connected 2018 or 19 um you'd yet to really throw yourself into the marathon so i feel like as i have um in some ways eased off the marathon you have gone on full bore and have like tried every number of things it's kind of fun and marcus i'm not sure about you i find it like it's like this guy just keeps like pillaring himself <laughs> with the marathon and we get <laughs> we get to enjoy it we get to learn from it um <laughs> hopefully he gets to like carry some of the best insights forward for his athletes like you well i appreciate that and two things come to mind one about your boston marathon experience and how how uh, valuable that this is for this series but also just in general because I've found, and people wouldn't really know this until they've been in the position, but I've run 18 something marathons and not, you know, eight of Boston like you, but I've run marathons where I don't run them all out. I run them as what you sort of called as a charity runner. And I feel like you get a different perspective of the race and the course if you don't run all out. And when I mm -hmm. ran New York Marathon in 2019 as a long run for Valencia, so four weeks before Valencia, and for, you know, for, this is a just to compare like the intensity of both runs. New York, I ran 248 and then Valencia around 227 and Valencia was my target run. So that goes to show I was sort of 21 minutes slower. Yes, New York's a harder course. But the point is that experience, experiencing New York Marathon not going all out, I think was far different to what it would have been if I'd run it all out because I was able to take in the crowd, actually high five people, take whatever I ate hot dogs and whatever I was taking from the people in the, in the crowd. And, uh, and it was, it was valuable. So I think having your experience in running it all out, but then also not is really helpful yeah. in this case. Um, relating to yeah. sweat elite, I appreciate that very much. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've actually started sweat elite in on the, you know, on the, with the core understanding that I, or the realization that I felt like I failed as a middle distance runner because I didn't qualify for the teams I wanted to qualify for. And so my, initial motivation was to go, what am I missing and what don't I know? Mm. And so I think everything comes from that position of, of wanting to produce content rather than this is how to do it. I'm like, no, I actually don't know. So I've discovered it and here it is. And like you said, take it or leave it. It might, it might hurt you, but here it is. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, it's very interesting. I mean, at this point, like you're saying, Marcus, we have uh, enough time to do some really good training before Boston. And at the same time, most people are like, fairly well within the thick of what they're doing. Um, maybe not like switching it up too, too much and hopefully like feeling good about their plan. Um, and at the same time, like there will be bumps in the road. I just uh, came down sick for two days with a stomach bug that might, that has been going around our neighborhood. And I just try to remember like these things happen as part of a, you know, multi-month build. Like you're not going to hit everything that's put on a plan. And the plan is just like, you know, written in pencil for, you know, what could be. So, um, yeah, Marcus, where should we, where should we start? There's so much about this course that, uh, about the course and the event that I love to take on. Um, I, just a spoiler for like what I'm going to be referring to. I am, I'm coaching six athletes. And then in thinking about what, how I wanted to prepare them for Boston, I ended up spinning up like a, a virtual workshop. Um, so I've been doing a series of one hour sessions where we've been going, literally one hour on goal setting and sort of winter training one on like running form and sort of like how to navigate hills then we have yet to do the ones on fueling course weekend logistics because i've learned from a lot of people who've asked me questions that like just like making the most but not too much of the boston marathon weekend can be a lot and i know we're we're gonna plan to meet again to 
dive deeper on some of these. Um, and so like all of those all together, um, each can take quite a bit of time. So I just like, I'm sure people have questions. Um, although I'm finding the number one question that stands out is just like, come on, Peter, tell me how to pace this thing. This mad <laughs> roller coaster of a, of a course. Like, uh, they're thinking about their Strava no. graph, their Strava post already. Yeah. Yeah. They're already like, how will it come? Actually, it's hilarious. Strava does this like a taller line for a fast and then a shorter line for a slow. And so if you think about it, there's a bit this trend where, um, I reposted a screenshot of someone from New York and it looks like this and then it just curves in. And I put in like a, a gif of like a little eating, mon like a Pac-Man. Um, and I was, I was like, anyone, <laughs> anyone else, this was of my athlete actually. And he had slowed down. He's still ran pretty well, but I was like, anyone else's look like this, like a Pac-Man ate out their splits. <laughs> All these people are probably like, hey, why would you screenshot my splits? And then someone else like, no, those were my splits. So, I mean, like, it's pretty common, I'd say, for the marathon. But um, that said, we all aspire to make it slightly more steady. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think there's a couple of things that you both touched on that I really want to go back to. Matt, when you're talking about New York and saying about, you know, you run it at a certain pace and, you know, you know, that kind of reminded me of the first time I ran Boston to the second time I ran Boston heartbreak hill the first time i ran it i thought i was running at um not as fast effort and the second time i was running it at more higher effort and the first time i was like heartbreak is not that bad second time heartbreak i was like jesus christ <laughs> when will this end so it got um, worse <laughs> and it definitely humbled me it reminded me of like what peter said in the one your essay is talking about you know at that point in the race you can tell who's bluffing uh, and who's not to this <laughs> <laughs> So um, do you want to talk oh, a little no. bit about that, those hills, Peter, for the people that don't know? This week's episode is brought to you by Pillar Performance. Pillar is a sports micronutrition company. I'm currently testing out the following products. Triple magnesium. I take that approximately an hour before going to bed. This product basically helps relieve sleeplessness and optimizes your sleep cycles. With the citrate and the salated magnesiums will help iron out any muscle aches, pains, cramps during the training. I'm also using the Ultra B Active, which I take in the morning with breakfast. This is basically a multivitamin and they use like a high strength dose of activated B vitamins, which help energy production by promoting metabolism of your fats, carbs, and proteins consumed. Then I'm also using the Ultra C, which I take at any time of day, one time. It's not really time sensitive, but I normally have it in the morning with breakfast. And this basically helps with my immune system, keeps it strong and avoid the feelings of being run down due to high stress loads from training, work, and all that kind of madness. If you really want to find out more, go online and type in pillarperformance.shop and you can get 15% off your first time purchase using the code Marcus. Okay, with that being said, let's head back to the episode. Yeah. Oh man, the Newton Hills. Um, How many times have you covered this one, Bronca? Yeah. I mean, if it's just you must like... You look, this is going to be perfect. <laughs> yeah, this is one. It's wonderful. Like, I love the Newton Hills and like, to me, what I want to do is I want to build up the Newton Hills for people and make it as amazing and as important as it is. And yet this is a theme that it's coming up again and again in my workshop. Let's not forget about the five miles after. Like I want to name the five miles after, you know, it's like, I don't know what we would call them, but like, like the Newton Hills become so like large in people's minds and they fall from 17 to 21. So that's about when most people's marathons get like really real. You go like, oh, okay, how many cards do I really have? And you know, at 17, you're like, well, I, I don't know. Maybe I'll like catch up <laughs> on the river, river and I'll be all good. And then, <laughs> for a poker reference for some friends. And then by 21, you're like, all right, uh, here's where I'm sitting. Can I, and I can't bluff anymore. So the, the beauty of the Newton Hills, I think is that um, almost quite literally, like there's very few turns in the course until the very famous last right hand, right on Hereford, left on Boylston. Um, but the, the cause I turn at 17 around the firehouse really marks the beginning of the uphills. And so, um, I have said to people like, you can break down the course as simply as like running the first 16 and a bit controlled, then making that turn, right, seeing the uphill. And like, that's when the gun goes off, uh, for the true competition of the race, because if at that point you have nine miles to go and like anyone who's run a good marathon knows, like if you can run well, those last nine miles, like 
you might look back as I always point this out. We always look back on our PR day and think we could have gone faster. Like that's just universally true. Like when it all clicks, you think like it was really rare to think like, Oh, there's nothing else I could have gotten out of myself because it was the day that it was going well. Um, so with that said, you want to turn the right hand turn and look at the, the upcoming hill that sort of slopes to the right. It, like it's deceptive because it slopes away and then around the, the around the crowd, but it yeah. builds up and over, um, up to the, it goes over the highway. Um, and it's just like, uh Oh, here we go. And so it's a series of an uphill, uh, sort of like difficult stretch and then a flat rolling stretch and then an uphill stretch and a flat rolling stretch. And so I say flat because, and rolling, cause it's sort of both. And so it's this, I think of it almost like a workout where it's like hard, easy, hard, easy, hard, easy. Um, and that said, I just really want people, everyone wants to know, like I've found out through running this workshop that people want all this information, but they really want to know, like, how do I make it through that gauntlet? Uh, unscathed or how do I make it through that with my wheels still on? And I, I think my answer is like, you have to like no holds bar, like gut check with yourself. Like, am I running too hard or not? Um, and they want to know, there are pace calculators you can look at online that say like, Oh, if you want in three hours, that would roughly based on pure elevation math, um, that would look like a seven minute to start, even though it's downhill. And then there's like a lot of things that go into it. Um, but the, you know, if you want to run three hours, which is six forty nine pace, like it roughly goes between, you know, like six, like 20 on the downhills and seven, 10 on the uphills and it all averages out. But the reality is I aspire for the athletes I coach to not be looking at their watch when they turn that and going uphill and just really checking in with, how do I feel? Do I feel like I'm running in a sustainable way? And do I feel like I could go harder, but I'm not going harder and I will use that effort later. Um, and so it's a series of, you know, running under control and, you know, looking around at the people around you and taking in the crowd, but also just being like, I can only run as hard uphill as I can run. And then I will try to shift gears every time that it flattens out. So it's more a series of control but like you're saying, difficult, like, oh, no, this is hard. But every time it's like almost audacious to say when it's hard, I'm going to ease off a little bit um, than to say, like, I'm going to grind. Because what you do is you end up with so many people. Like if I had a dollar for everyone, say, like, I got to the top of heartbreak, totally cashed. And then it was just like a struggle all the way home. Um, and I'm like, oh, struggle all the way home when it's a downhill and the crowds are going wild and just like. Uh, it's like, it's such a shame. I think of it as like, you know, the cherry on top and you're just like, oh no, couldn't enjoy that. Had to throw it on the, in the trash. Um, and so a ser those series of hills, I think of as so important that like, you really do need to do a bunch of things right that we'll, we, we can talk about um, to earn the right to like race those final five miles. And even if you're maintaining up, going up those hills, like w within control, you'll find it's like, um, it's almost like people are rocketing back at you. Like I've had people in, um, particularly back when I used to start like further back, there would be people ahead of me and they would just start to walk and they'd come flying back at you and have to, you know, you'd have to go around them because it's like, they'd be charging and you're charging and you're like, just put my head down and grind. And then they would like stop and walk. And you'd be like, you'd be like, Whoa, this person's in front of me. Like they've just basically exploded and like, they're just going to start walking. And so this is a long, long answer. I'm sure I could just <laughs> solo monologue. Keep going. Brilliant. <laughs> but it's the, the idea is that like you do check in with who's around you. You check in with your heart rate. Um, I used to wear a heart rate monitor back in like 2016, 2017. And I used it kind of inversely. I would use it in training and try to get a sense of, okay, when do I feel in control? And then look at the numbers. And I had the sense of like, that was back back when I was running um, like low 240s. And I was like, oh yeah, like 165-ish. If it's under 165, like I had seen in training, like that felt very sustainable for me. And so then I would use that in race day as I was going up those hills, I would look and it was like, I'd be like, man, this is hard. And I'd look and it'd be like, you know, 162. And I'd be like, okay, like I'm still, I would use it as like confidence rather than, um, 
oh, I'm at 172, I should back off. Um, my goal was not to like l- go over and then use it to force me to slow down. Um, but man, like all I can say to people is if you have legs, those final five miles, like the crowds are nuts. It is downhill. Um, I mean, it's just nuts. Um, so yeah, I think that's, I'm curious if that's reflective of, I know you ran hard last year, Marcus, and it was like, um, it's, it becomes a bit of a blur when you're really going hard. Um, I'm curious how well that matches your memory. Do you know when you described after 16 and a half, like that was like a really perfect description of it for me personally, like the sort of it's rolling and then, you know, you've got the sort of flattish bits, but they're not really flat. Um, and I remember when the bit, when you get towards the end and the over heartbreak, that's when like you felt that the race for me started as well. Um, but I think the, thing as well for a bit of a context as well heartbreak hill in itself isn't that terrible it's just the stuff beforehand which basically gets you into that place and i remember do you know the the actual incline before um heartbreak mm-hmm. that's the one that tricked me in my head i was like in my head i i, I counted it wrong um and i sort of thought this is heartbreak and then i was getting towards the end so i was like this is not heartbreak and do you know it sort of plays in your mind like you're like damn like I've got another fucking hill to go up. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it yeah. does play games in your head. It is weird. It's just a weird, I've said this on, I think other calls we've had on Relay about like, I often, I realized years ago that I think if you ran the first team 13 miles of that course and just finished in Wellesley, like if the three of us met on Sunday, I think it would be like rather quick and you would feel like a little beaten up. You'd be like, that was weird. I just felt like, a, I feel a little more like, um, I feel a little more off than I would expect. And so I don't think it's like some magical, like, you know, it's, I'm making it sound like some foreign, uh, like one of my son's like sci-fi books of like, there's dragons and like mystery out there. But like, you do feel, I mean, I was pretty well trained last year and I think at mile eight or nine, like my calf, like did a little like crampy wiggle. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like nine mile. I was like, just, and I was able to hold it off. Like, I was able to like smooth out my stride and I don't know what it was, but it's just, it gets you in weird ways. And so I will say like the other thing I say to my friends is they're like, dude, after their first Boston, they're like, dude, I felt like trash at like 21. I felt like, and I'm like, okay. Yeah. And like, it's like, you're gonna feel like trash. And then it's like what you do with that trash. I, I like it. And it sounds super dramatic, but, um, I mean, I had a buddy in 2019, he was just torching me in workouts. He was just lighting me up. I would just be like, bye. And then we started in separate spaces because I got invited to that elite crowd that year. And, um, afterwards we're like limping around the North Ed, getting some cannolis. And I'm like, dude, what happened? Like what happened? I beat him by like 10 or 12 minutes. And he's like, he just looks down at his quads. He's like, it's someone like someone had stabbed me in both of my quads. <laughs> I mean, this man had gone out in like 69 minutes for the half. You know, he was like, today it's on. Like it is on. I am firing on all cylinders. Like we are firing, like guns blazing. And you're just like, <sighs> I'm like, oh no, oh no. So, I mean, he was welled he had every reason to believe he could break 70 for the half and like an, on a downhill course and like be ready to go. Um, and he just like lit himself in flames. Like it was just nuts. Um, amazing. I got yeah. a couple of questions for you, Bronco about thing. It really, firstly, huge thank you to, um, to you for, for sharing that sort of four to five minutes about Boston. I feel like I'm more mentally prepared for this course now having listened to that because just the way you described it was was really easy for me to sort of envision me, myself going through it. But the two questions I have based on the last couple of things you said that I'm super curious about. Firstly, you said if we met at halfway of the course, you would feel like that. I'm curious to know if you were to compare like the first half of the course and then let's say start another race to start halfway and finish at the end. So the first half of the course and the second half of the course. How fast do you think each of those sections are comparing to if you just did a half marathon in good weather on the flat so first half would you say it's 30 seconds quicker than that the second half i assume it might be two to three minutes slower than that that's the first question i have for you and then i'll shoot you with the next yeah yeah i mean i i think i think of it oh shoot i need to look a little more closely i think i think of the first half as like a minute fast um 
Like, I think if you just ripped it, I mean, <laughs> I've seen people be like, I don't, I might just rip the first half and try to set up half marathon PR. Um, it's, it would destroy your legs. I mean, I've never run one of these, like, um, there's a rising popularity of these downhill races, um, where you can just fly off a mountain. Um, and so I think I think of it as like whatever shape I'm in, it's about, I think I go like a minute, two minutes, um, roughly. I think of, I mean, I don't think the negative split, positive split, what do we call like even split? I think mm-hmm. even split should be like anywhere within a minute or 90 seconds ish, you know, because it's like, I mean, that's a lot of, sometimes people sort of call it an even split if it's within like 15 seconds. And I'm like, that's crazy. Like that's a lot of running to be dead level. Um, so I think I think of it as more like you want to be fast a minute. It's, it gives you a minute and then it takes two minutes. So it's like a minute slow. Um, but roughly, but I think I would have to check my math and I'm sure someone could check my math for me. Um, because I, I definitely try to give myself a range on the front end. And then I try to, because I try to give myself, um, just some gimme seconds on the, the latter half. Um, the combination of, I mean, the real, the real thing is like, you need to give yourself some seconds to slow. You need to like internalize. I'm going to go slower and that's totally fine. I think there's so much self judgment around the splits people don't want to see. You know, like as oh, someone yeah. who runs marathons at 520 pace, like I don't want to see a six minute split um, going up heartbreak, but like I guess the answer is I just don't look at it and I just keep going. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. um, and it's just like, it, it's that thing. You, I mean, you must see it all the time. And you, you both are coaches and you see it like, there's the thing that athletes will acknowledge. And then there's the thing that they like, don't even want to admit. And it's like the, the splits that they're like, no, 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 I don't want to see an eight minute pace. I'm, I'm willing to like dig deep to not see an eight minute pace. And you're like, are you really, are you willing to blow up at the top of heartbreak to not see it? Like, um, so yeah, yeah. I think it's good to like build in like, Hey, I'm going to slow down on this section and that's totally fine. And then honestly, the, um, the, the last four miles are just vi- you just watch people are running on fumes. And so I've had friends, I've literally had friends be beating themselves up and be like, I gave in, I didn't run hard. I wish I could have run harder the last four miles. And then I've screenshotted my splits and their splits. This is a day where everyone's like, Peter, you ran so well. Da, 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 da. Um, and I've compared and I've been like, eh, this was a woman, Emily. And I was like, Emily, we both slowed down the final four miles relative to our average pace. Um, but I was further up and everyone's like, Oh, you're running well. And I'm like, you ran really well. Um, she had run really well that day, but she felt like it's rare that someone finishes those last four miles and doesn't feel like they could have, like they should have been able to go harder quote unquote. And so, you know, if, and we can talk about time goals at Boston and yada, yada, like, and the, the benefits and drawbacks to them. Um, in this case, this woman, Emily came in with a certain time, which I don't, this doesn't get talked about enough, like seeds her at a certain number in the field. And your bib is like based on your seed. And so she had finished it. Let's say she like came in rate rank with bib 15,000 and like finished 12,000 or something. I'm like, you definitively like surpassed largely what you were. Um, so focus on that. Um, and I think it's harder for people to, internalize that because they're they're like oh that's meaningless i'm just going to look at the clock whereas like when you're in the top 250 in the race let's say people like oh wow like you finished here you finished there and it's like it's all relative it's all like similar things but it just seems different i think um so i've often felt like i was encouraging my friends to like slow down when when your body's telling you to slow down um and then like try to embrace those miles like i always there's a lot of hype around uh, the early downhills, but there's a lot of um, there's a lot of traffic uh, early on. It's like, so I think we can talk about hill running in more specifics, but like, you know, I don't, I encourage people to like try to run within reason going downhill to try to practice running downhill in the, in the coming weeks. That's a great tip for people. And, you know, with this many weeks out, like it's hard on the body to run downhill. And so it like takes some, like familiarity and some coordination. Um, and it's also difficult to like really take in the first three to four miles. Cause it's so early. You have so long to go to like bomb down those Hills feels risky and it is risky. Whereas like mile 24, I'm like, guys, mile 24, it was the fast Meb when he won 
Boston 10 years ago, that was his fastest split of the day. Uh, he just like bombed down 24. Now your legs feel like absolute trash. Like, <laughs> like it's a, like, it's just like the crowds are going nuts and you're like, Oh no, this is when I'm supposed to go hard. Um, and, you know, you, you have that little voice in the back of your head of like, I made some plans for this, but maybe I'll just like, I'll just sustain here. And it's like, so you really have to like mentally prepare, like to race those miles. Um, which sounds all nice and good when you're sitting here in uh, March, but um, by f- like by the middle of the day on April 15th, it's like, Oh no, th- that was a horrible idea. This is going to be really hard. And it's like, yeah, that's what we signed up for. It gets real. Yeah. I, I want to talk about the Hills, but I know Matt's got another question. Cause I know you were about to touch into it. I was about to oh. go like, no, well, hold on. <laughs> well, it's relating exactly to the Hills and you referenced a teammate of yours that you trained with and sort of, was stitching you up in training, but then you beat him by 10, 12 minutes on the day. I'm curious to know, and it sounds like the difference was that the training maybe, I mean, yeah, my, my question is what did you do that he didn't do in order for you to be able to beat him by 10 to 12 minutes on the day, despite him, you know, you could probably agree he was aerobically fitter than you maybe, oh, yeah. but you yeah. were the man to beat him on the day. And for what reason? So I have gotten super lucky in that um, I have had training mates uh, preparing for Boston several years. I had, um, friends and training mates preparing for Boston and then actually competing with me. Um, and I mean, that's just worth its weight in gold because of the stuff we talked about where, so 2019, I'm like, I go to Boston with six of my friends and like, I could definitely have finished sixth for us, like absolutely possible. Um, but it's the marathon and through a variety of like mishaps and um, craziness at like three or four of them, it was their first Boston. We were trying to win the Boston team title, uh, which is like a very unspoken about, like for some reason, like small thing of like the average time, the total time of your top three runners. Um, And so I had my teammate and friend Patrick and I had been invited to the pro field um, last he got invited early and i got invited the week of and i'm like all right so yeah there's my number from when i got to be part of the pro field it was an amazing experience but it's actually pretty daunting because you're sort of left in no man's land Uh, that was the first year that they separated the men's start from the rest of the field by two minutes and so i was anticipating it'd be sort of an honor um actually i didn't get in at first and then i was like well i was disappointed but i was like i could run up with them and then they I invited me and they also announced that it would be a separation. So we are off in this bubble. There's a long way of saying the benefit of I had was running with a friend who I was able to check in with. And when you know a training mate and you know what they're capable of and you respect them, it almost is like a mirror to yourself. So I, we get off going, it happened to be slightly humid. It had rained that morning and then it got warm. So it's like sort of like baking you from below every day. I mean, that's another thing we could talk about. Like Boston is either it's hot or it's cold or it's rain, windy or it's rainy or it's like um, it's warm early or it's warm late. So it's helpful to have a teammate to just say like, to check in with like if you i mean it gets to the point where you know your teammates breathing patterns and i knew that this man who i was training with patrick he was one of the men who was i felt definitely fitter than me he had just run 217 for the marathon shortly before that um four months before and i could tell his breathing was off and so you're like okay i'm doing all right um but not that great and his breathing's off and so then we i think we were planning to run like two 520s and then at some point I turned around and I was like, I feel like shit. And he's like, I feel like shit. Um, and we're both like, let's just slow down five seconds a mile. Um, and just like, it is what it is. You know, it's like, you can only do what you can do and let's just make the most of what we can make of this. And man, if that didn't turn out to be like the best thing that ever happened to me, like I was able to respect the, how I was feeling. We were able to go together. I ended up beating Patrick by a minute or so on that day, but we both had like pretty strong days. Whereas the guy, and this was, I think maybe his fifth Boston. Um, it was my fifth or sixth at the time. Um, whereas the guys who were fitter than me, who were like, they started at the start of the open field and they were just like, today's the day. Like we are fit and we have multiple guys and we are going to hammer. Um, and so they, I mean, I think I could say respectfully, like they had no respect for the course. They were just like, like 
I'm going to use the downhills. I'm going to use the flats. And they were more than capable of just like flying on the flats and flying on the downhills. And it, I guess just did a lot of damage to their quads. I like you could boil it down to as simple as like just trauma to the muscles of their quads, because then once the course starts to turn upwards, they were just like, Oh shoot. Like I have no power. I'm getting like all this, you know, this pain signal sent to me and you can just lose a tremendous amount of time in the final 10 miles. And so that's where I was still racing. Cause I, like, it's hard to underestimate understate, like how amazing it is to have a positive uh, mental loop and like momentum oh, feeling yeah. mm, in the final massive. 10 versus a negative. Um, and yeah, if you feel like you're catching people, if you feel like you're fighting for something, it could be like, and it doesn't have to be, a time or a place it could be like you're just like you're running for a cause you believe in you're like tr running to make the most of the day but if you like you're still engaged those final nine miles um it's really incredible and so yeah it's like my i mean that they're both named chris but one guy chris i had been referencing about his quads the other guy chris i think ran like 236 237 and we just have photos of him walking at mile 22 he's just walking um and like we knew you know jason suarez i'm not afraid to fail the photographer he's like world yeah. world famous travels the world he just like took these like beautiful soft focused like shots of our buddies just walking along the course mm -hmm. and we're like oh man who knew you could like walk at 236 um <laughs> but That's it was cool. like they had gone out so hard that they you know they ran something like a 69 you know 117 118 um so it's just, it's hard to overstate how much risk there is involved in going fast early. And at the same time, like you should che check in with your body and like run the downhills in a way that feels free and feels moving. I don't think people should like artificially, you know, break and get into the territory of like um, slamming on the brakes and running in some artificial way. Uh, I think it's just like trying to respect that flow. I really like hearing the nuance and, how to race Boston. So no, thank you for like, like giving a bit more context to that. And something I was thinking about was just kind of talking a little bit about hill training. And I don't really want to go down the kind of the boring, okay, these are the hill workouts that you need to do. I'd be curious to talk a little bit, um, Peter, about the hill training that you're doing now. But also, I want to bring Matt into it first um, and to talk a little bit about the training that we're doing together to prep me for the hills of Boston. Yeah. yeah, sure. So yeah, we've been basically specifically preparing for about four weeks already. Um, we're, do we're doing a pretty standard seven-day cycle where there's a midweek workout that involves um, uh, a combination of threshold and VO2 max work. So it's all faster than marathon effort or I don't like to specifically work around at marathon pace just because of elevation and, and, and stress and sleep and all these things. But that midweek workout for Marcus has typically been on a Thursday, uh, sometimes on a Wednesday, depending on what he's got going on. And then on the weekend, we're doing a long run. And everything in between that is just sort of easy, between 45 and 80 minutes uh, of easy running at an aerobic pace. So pretty simple um, cycle. And on the weekends, we're now up to, well, this weekend, it'll be 20 miles. And then the following weekend, it'll be 22 miles. So we're really getting up to the longer runs now. But Marcus has been awesome with sort of telling me, um, you know, he's got these specific courses and these ideas in mind around doing these blocks with hills involved. So he's brought a workout to me called the 242 workout, which involves um, some tempo running for two miles at the start, a section in the middle that's a four mile segment with quite a lot of hills as well. So Marcus is sort of bringing the hills ideas to me in, in a sense, and we're working together to implement them. But in my eyes at the moment, and Bromker, it'd be great to hear what you think about this. I think that there's I mean, it's mandatory in my eyes to be doing um, these workouts on the hills, at least one of those every week on a pretty hilly course. How you structure those is another thing, as in like, do you actually segment out a part of a run to be downhill, uphill, or mm. do you just say, do this workout on a relatively hilly course? I've been saying the later, do this workout on a relatively hilly course. We both know, Marcus and I, and of course, Bromka knows that there's around about a thousand feet of elevation gain, give or take, I think it's a hundred meters. I uh, could be slightly off with that. It's about 330 meters. Um, I'm, I'm in meters. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what feet are, um, but I do my best to convert. But um, yeah, we know that that's about how much. So we know that in a long run of 20 miles or 22 miles, we want to be trying to get in around about the same elevation gain or slightly less because that would mimic the Boston course. So that's what we have been doing. Um, 
And I think so far you've put yourself in a position to run really well in Boston. Um, we'll eventually get to the conversation around what time we should go for because I don't, you know, Bromka's got some good insight into thinking maybe that's not even a good idea to pick a specific time, but we'll talk about that um, and all the different dynamics to that. But that's what we have been doing. Um, yeah, we've been yeah. four weeks in. I guess we've got about six and a half weeks to go until taper time and so far it's been going pretty well. Yeah, I think one of the things that I am sort of want to touch on what you just said there I think is really important is just the the workouts on the hills and I think for me and it's something you said as well Peter even in the race but it's something I've put in the workout you've got to like almost separate your mind from looking at the paces because some of the times I do the workouts either before work early morning which you're not feeling great anyways or sometimes you do it on the weekend which is um, later in the morning um, and it's still like the same sort of thing all right don't look too much at the pace at the 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 actual paces but look at the effort um, and it is a bit of a mind trip because sometimes like my usual route if I'm doing like a Berlin block I'd be like in Victoria Park just doing the flats just that two mile loop just, just flying around it mm. uh, but obviously that's not re- what's required for for Boston so yeah I mean I think I think both ways of training on hills are good um, I think sometimes people there's classic stories because they're Portland, Oregon, where I live is where Nike is. And so there's pro athletes here. Um, So you hear these stories about people who have found local ways of almost mimicking like a downhill and then a flat. And then you come back and you run the uphill at around mile 16 of the training run and, you know, really dialing in the training route that mimics exactly a long run that yada, yada, yada. And I, I mean, I don't think that's bad. I just don't think it's totally necessary. I think of it more as, can you mimic the sensations that you're going to experience on race day such that it feels very natural to both like um, throw yourself into flight downhill um, without crashing and without like over revving without overdoing it. Um, So, I mean, I I land as simply as like, there's a three and a half mile um, the tallest hill in Portland on the West side has a three and a half mile route around it called Fairmont Avenue and Fairmont Boulevard. And it just happens to like undulate quite a bit. And if you do, if you think of a workout, you know, multiple three mile reps or, you know, multiple five mile reps, um, and then you apply it on that route, it's nothing magical. It's just like none of the uphills are so dramatic that you think like, Oh, this is like, you know, just a digger and I'm going to have to settle in. So, I mean, you call that probably like 4%, uh, you know, three to 5%. Um, I always think when I have athletes do hill reps, I like to get them like more like six, eight to 9% because then you're like changing and driving your knees. Um, in my experience versus the like more shallow hill is like kind of runnable and, um, so when people say like they're going to find a hilly route, I sometimes worry that they're going to find like that mountain that they run up, which I think totally can be um, advantageous if used like what it is. So we would sometimes like as t- training mates be like, okay, we're going to you know do this run. And then when we get to these two gargantuan hills, we're going to like tempo up them together and we're just going to it's going to suck. It's going to be hard. We're going to like have to get all the form cues and all the breathing calm and settle in knowing that these hills are way steeper than anything at Boston, but just sort of like anything like you do VO two max work, even though you're not going to try to run at that pace on race day. Um, and so, yeah, I think both are valuable, but I would encourage people to check in with like um, both. Can they give themselves like you're saying, weekly opportunities to check in with how hard am I running and is this sustainable? And um, it's okay if it's above the line, if it's like a shorter effort and it needs to be below the line, if I'm, you know, if I'm going to attempting to incorporate this into a long run and then on the downhills, you know, can I, again, go downhill without slapping my feet, without like jarring my body, without sending all of that? Um, Can I hold my body in a way where I'm like, skipping across the ground and not um kind of like landing on my heels and smashing into it um so yeah i mean it it feels like it gets maybe overly technical or like i don't want to get into people's heads around like oh no it's like a million things to think about it really should be intuition based and like this this feeling of flow um but i think we get away from that i mean even the way you're describing your workouts marcus i'm fascinated by We've added more and more data to our watches available. Oh, and I love where you're going here. Yeah. 
and it gets people so far away from like just that feeling of Bronco, like, can I make a statement that I, I think you'd find funny? <laughs> yeah. Approaching Boston, having absolutely no idea how to run a marathon may actually be the best way. Huh. Yeah. I mean, if well, you just provided think- that, you know, provided that, you know, it's very hilly at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like maybe not no idea what the course looks like. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, because then you yeah, won't I, think about or worry about paces. You'll probably naturally go, I'm going to run to how I feel. And I know yeah. there's hills coming, so I'm going to be a little bit conservative. If you were a little conservative, I mean, I wrote a whole piece for Podium Runner years ago called Don't Burn the Marshmallow because I was running the fall Boston and I was teaching my son that summer how to roast marshmallows. And I was, I realized in my mind after being like we'll hold it close to the fire but not too close and like you can always hold it closer to the fire later but you can't unburn it um i was like that's the perfect analogy for like how people run the run boston like you again you always have these five miles at the end to really unleash like if you come ripping down boylston and you're like whoo man i had so much left like you must have run very conservatively so it's this idea of yeah like you're saying um with like proper reservation awareness but also really checked in with your body and just like the way that watches start to give us our instantaneous pace i think if if it could give us our moving pace and it didn't cause this cycle of like excitement or fear or like self self self-judgment and it was just if, if it was purely just like numbers and it didn't hit us in any way that would be fine but i think it sends people into oh i'm moving too slowly i gotta go um and yeah i mean some of the smartest running I've ever seen one year, I think it was 2017 turning, we turned uphill. Patrick had gotten ahead of me by like 20 meters. There's a, you know, a, a man I've run Boston with several times. And then I caught him going up over the highway at 17 and a half. And he's like, I'm just going to hang, hang back for a bit. Like, I just, I'm not feeling it at the moment. Um, sure enough, he came like charging back like two miles later and was feeling good and moved past me. And, you know, we finished within like 30 seconds of each other and again that type of like awareness of how you're doing but also there for me there was always this validating effect of like i give lots of props to my teammates who are around me because you're like i think i'm feeling this and then i know how good that guy is and he's in the similar zone okay like i'm all right um so it's not to say i'm by any means like beyond like the needing to worry about like the self-judgment and the self-criticism and the concern around like i'm not doing it doing enough um but you can also like I've, I've had times where i was ahead of my friends and i was like hey i would be like you can't be negative now like you are beating the guys who should be beating you like you have to remain positive like and i would just like come up with all these scenarios in my head of like i know you feel horrible um but like it is going well, you know, because your brain, you get so tired going like mile 23. It's like this gradual roller along BU. Um, and it's just like, this is so dreadful. And um, you see like, I mean, in my, you see people just all of a sudden stopping and walking. You know, for me, I see pros that have like blown up and they're just like, and I'm like, okay, like that guy's a professional runner and I'm about to like blow by him. Um, like, but your mind is like, really trying to make you slow down and really trying to make you give in. I had a buddy um, who I knew from college standing at 5k to go. And he was just like cackling, laughing. He's like 5k to go, Bronco, 5k to go. And he was just like, it was this cruel punishment. And he knew I was running well, but he was just like, this is going to suck so much for you. And I was like, I know it's going (laughs) to suck. It's going to be horrible. Um, But I mean, like we can do these hard things. I think like all these things that people talk about, um, I feel like something like cold water therapy has become like way too exploded because of how much money you're making people are making off of it. But I do think things like that, like going, having those techniques of like, I can, I can subject myself to discomfort and I'll be okay. Like I'm all right. Um, This is hard, but like, you know, you check in with like, I don't need to go to the medical tent. I'm just like in discomfort and it'll be over in a matter of time. Pete, I'm curious. Um, (laughs) If you were going to do an episode of sweat elite, right? And you want to talk about one specific hill workout that you're doing for this Boston training, not for your athletes, but you're doing like, what would that be? Oh, um, I mean, I will say I'm a bad, I'm almost a bad coach because I get too far. I don't love the numbers. I don't love the specifics. Like I don't actually love the specifics. Like you can tell how passionate I am about all of it. Um, I would just say like any, 
it, it's me rolling with my friends up around um it's like a, a steady tempo um around this three and a half mile like rolling undulating where you're like um you know you're getting slightly ahead of people you're getting slightly behind you're having to like constantly check in with um you know i was up there last week doing like 10 miles of slight progression and at one point i was just like oh this is getting hard and i closed my eyes and then i like we kind of it, again it's like never being steady like we then were tipping downhill and then t- sort of s- turning and so then i clipped my friend's heel and then i was like oh i'm so sorry so sorry like um it's like i'm, I'm giving you an essayist answer to a scientist a, a question for a scientist um but i i guess i would say like finding that to me it always culminates my training blocks almost always culminate with that 15 16 mile tempo that's like starts slightly slower than marathon effort and then finishes slightly faster and yet i try to avoid overhyping that workout because people can i mean one people end up racing it to say like look how like fit i am i'm so ready and you're like well you just sort of race uh what was intended to be a you know a practice session and then i also don't want people to get too in their heads i've definitely got almost too much in my head about like well if that's the pace then what does that mean um because you know these are practice sessions they're intended to like improve your fitness not prove your fitness um so yeah i mean i would just say like um so it's anything it's like any so everything i've heard then it sounds like a 15 mile hilly course with your friends the second half has to be faster than the first half and time is irrelevant and you have to make sure you finish not all out yes thank you thank you for helping me <laughs> Oh, I just paraphrased yeah. your, your, yeah, your, yeah, yeah. your, your, long your, answer. Yeah. Don't, I mean, that's the thing you can like get going a little bit at the end, but I've definitely had friends who you see it all the time. They kick in the, the tempo at the end with three weeks to go. And you're like, uh, oh, I mean, as long as you didn't, uh, really cash yourself, but oftentimes that does deplete people more than it's worth. Great advice. I think there are different ways to approach it. And then how do I say this? Like you can, yeah, you can. I mean, I wrote an article years ago that was like, you can chop it up as like 10, uh, 16 and 10, you know, like 16 miles, which is not uncommon for how to approach a marathon. And then there's the more nuanced, like five downhill, 10 flat, and then uh, one, two, like two, one, two, one, two, one. Um, so there's like nuanced ways or more general ways. Um, but the thing I would say to people is like, as particularly as I'm getting, I'm not getting faster. Um, I'm trying to write a piece right now about like this idea of urgency and like what you need versus want out on the course. Um, because I think when we're talking about Matt, like times and what people really like what they're doing out there, what they're striving for. Um, what I have found is that like, there were definitely years I was out there and I just like needed to like pour myself into it. Like for different reasons on different years, I was just like, I am so driven to pour every last ounce of myself into this performance um, that that sort of ha- translated into splits, but it was more what kept me kept me like so focused and still engaged. And that's everything from like I went to college in the Boston area. Like I know the hills. I know like I have like my old team. The guys are much younger than me now. Like we'll be out there at like the top of heartbreak cheering uh, my parents met at boston college and like i just get like emotional going through you know that era and i'm just like i think of like my dad ran it um many many years ago um and i just like i'm consumed by like staying in the moment and trying to race where um honestly like last year i was race i was running and i'd like had a lot going on and i was excited to be out there but these guys would come up and they're come on bro we gotta go like like we're gonna break 230 today and i'm like oh yeah like awesome like keep at it um and i just realized like uh uh-oh um (laughs) i've already done that i wasn't totally driven by it and i i didn't feel the same need i like had a desire to run well but um i think it's hard enough as a course that you get down there and you you're left with like, okay, what do I need to do today? Like comes to the forefront pretty clearly versus like, um, oh, what would be nice or what splits would I like to see? Okay, cool. There's so much we've touched on with just like the nuance of Boston training and all that sort of stuff. I think it's probably like a good place to kind of wrap it up because I know Peter, you had to 
drop off your kids. I will need to like drop off and pick up my kid. Now, <laughs> so I think that's just the Boston Marathon training life for for quite a few people. So um, enough, enough of me. I have a lot more questions for both of you next time we chat. <laughs> good stuff. Um, no, thank you both, uh, and looking forward to episode two. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good times. <laughs>